Hello and welcome to The Telegraph. I'm Dominic Nichols, the Associate Editor for Defence here. I'm delighted to be joined today by Admiral Sir Tony Radekin, Chief of the Defence Staff for Britain's Armed Forces, the boss, uh, the top of the tree, in charge of the whole shooting match, literally. Uh, we're going to have a chat about a few bits and pieces, end of year, bit of Christmas, a bit of uh, Ukraine, a bit of a few other bits and pieces in there. Uh, I hope you can stay with us for the whole time and uh, thank you very much for being here. Admiral, thank you very much for doing this. Very warm welcome to The Telegraph. No, thank you. Um, Christmas, there is always one. Who have you forgotten to send a Christmas card to this year? Uh, I don't know if I've forgotten. We had a debate as to whether or not uh, I should send one to General Gerasimov. Uh, I Your opposite number in Russia. My opposite number in Russia. We thought that that, that would be inappropriate. Um, and I suppose I'm now, I'm, now, I'm now racking my brain as to who have we really forgotten. I don't send many. I don't send many. And so I'm probably... I can probably get away with it because we only send a few Christmas cards and and therefore most people, I'm afraid, Fair are enough. off the list. Well, I, my, I mean, the postal strike, mine must still be lost somewhere. I mean, <laughs> is it normal to send one to General Gerasimov? <clears throat> no, but it was just a reflection um, of an extraordinary year and February going to Moscow, uh, meeting him, several other contacts since. Uh, wanting to maintain those communications with him and that has to be done on a formal basis and therefore a Christmas card wouldn't be appropriate and it wouldn't be appropriate normally to send one to him. Uh, the contrast is with uh, Valerie, um, with, with General Valerie in Ukraine and General uh, Zelushny. Uh, I penned him a note uh, and I gave him a, a bottle of his favourite whiskey, Glen Morangi. Uh, and I just had a nice message from him yesterday, um, because he he is at, he is in the thick of it. Um, I've seen him three times in in Kiev this year. Um, that's that's included going down to his 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 bunker. They change um, change location frequently, and. And, and, and part of that is with other chiefs, but is, is sort of giving him our, our warmth and support. It's a personal thing, as well as the professional element of, of how we're supporting Ukraine's armed forces. And what, um, but but that, that business of writing a handwritten note and giving him a bottle of his favorite whiskey, uh, I think you probably remember from your time, some of those things, when you're, when, when you're away, those, those are really important. Uh, and I got a lovely message from him uh, yesterday. We'll come on to Ukraine a little bit later, if, if I may. You say it's been a, an unusual first year uh, as Chief of Defence Staff. Three Prime Ministers, two monarchs, one war in Europe. Not quite the first year in command you were expecting. Which one of those has been the easiest to manage? The, pri the Prime Ministers have been the easiest to manage, um, which might be surprising for people, but I... I think if we'd said beforehand three prime ministers, gosh, the, you know, the turmoil that that would introduce and so on, and I, and it may be that my, the, you know, the defence area is slightly unusual, but I think actually there was a, there was, there was continuity all the way through, and, and I really appreciate that, and that, inc that included, that's included a trip to Kyiv with, with Boris Johnson, um, for Ukraine's Independence Day, another trip to Kyiv a few weeks ago with Prime Minister Sunak. Um, so that's been that's been relatively smooth, and that the, and that's not to say that the others have been a nightmare or anything. But it's just that the inevitably the funeral it's the pace at which everything has to come together, an amazing uh, response. But it's then the quality, right? This has got to, got to be impeccable. So that's. That's a hell of a pressure. And then the Ukraine element is obviously, that's, that's a constant backdrop at the moment. How did the two, n two new prime ministers in your tenure <coughs> respond to your, uh, your induction into the nuclear firing chain? Talk me through the, the sort of mood music in the, in the room as you're explaining the responsibilities there. So if I concentrate on, um, on Mr. Sunak, I think it's, it's this, it's, some of it is um, it's the fact that it happens on your first day and 
you're with the National Security Advisor and the Chief of Defence. And then you have a submariner expert who is in the Cabinet Office, a Royal Navy Captain. And what must be an extraordinary day for any individual when they become the Prime Minister. And you've got, I imagine, you've kind of got things in your own mind that you're going to, you're going to be giving your statements in Downing Street um, to the nation. And then you've probably gone through, you're, you're probably caught up in, in selecting your cabinet and, and all of the, the politics that goes with that. Uh, you've obviously got time with your cabinet secretary, both beforehand and, and on the moment you become prime minister. Um, and then with, um, with Rishi Sunak, it's, you go into the, into the, the bowels, as it were, of, of number 10, where it's a, it's a room where you can have above secret conversations. Uh, and then you go through with him so that he, he signs various documents which are crucial because it, it, it's, the, it's a formality of civilian control of the nuclear deterrent and that is vested in this individual, the Prime Minister. And then you have a conversation about letters of last resort which are only used in a particular circumstance. Um, and, and, then, and then the Prime Minister has some time as to how he wants to formulate those letters of last resort. And I think it's the importance of being an official and you're in an advisory role. And, and I think it must be the weight of responsibility that you're now the Prime Minister. And amongst that mass of things that you're responsible for, it includes this phenomenal power in terms of the, the nation's nuclear deterrent. Are you present when the letters of last resort are written? Is this something that happens later? So that, that, that can happen later. Prime Ministers can take their, their, their time. And the, I think most Prime Ministers, it, it be, that's the right thing to do. And then the, nobody knows what is in those letters. And that's the crucial aspect. This is, this is something private to that individual who records their decision for an event that we hope would never be required for that envelope to be opened up. Um, and that's almost the sanctity of it. And, and if you, previous prime ministers don't talk, don't talk about what they wrote in that, in that, in that letter. Um, nobody, we, don't, we don't see what is in the letter. Um, this is something intensely personal to, to each Prime Minister. Uh, and then when the, the previous Prime Minister's letter um, is then shredded, uh, and I, that to me is utterly crucial. We, we do not want to know um, what, what the instructions were. For people who do not know what we are, discussing here. The letters of last resort, as I understand it, are letters written to the, the four commanding officers of the four van, currently Vanguard class, soon to be Dreadnought class, nuclear powered, nuclear armed boats, Britain's nuclear deterrent, giving them orders from the Prime Minister of the day as to what to do in the event of no more messages from London. Yeah, it's a very peculiar circumstance. So, so so in the in this in yeah, the trouble with nuclear in the in the range of the the events that might happen with nuclear, which are, are things that are very very unlikely, you then get to the most unlikely, which is that uh, our our bomber has no comms, uh, and it's the situation where the inference from that, and that's over. I won't go into the detail, but but there are lots of ways of checking, and effectively. It's a situation where our own nation may, may have come under nuclear attack or is devastated. And the nation's nuclear deterrent is, is, is there and is still functioning somewhere in the North Atlantic. And there's a process whereby the captain goes to the first safe and the first safe has a letter from the first sea lord in terms of the instructions and the formality that the procedures that then have to be followed. And then for the executive order, 
Um, that is then in a second sa a safe, and that's the Prime Minister's letter of last resort. Thank you. We got a bit deep quite quite early <laughs> in this, but deeper than I was expecting. Um, so three Prime Ministers, two two monarchs. Where were you when you heard that <coughs> Queen Elizabeth had died? And um, did you allow yourself a little panic in those first few moments? No, I was with Ben. I was with Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary. We were on our way back from Germany. We'd just been to the contact group, uh, which was chaired by the US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin. This is the UK contract group, um, 50 nations, uh, others, others that joined by video. We'd been given the heads up during the day, and I think, as, as, as most people saw, the, 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 tone, the tone of the language coming from the palace was an indication that it was, it was serious. And then, as we were coming back, um, we got a heads up just before the announcement was going to be made. Uh, and somebody rightly made sure that me and the Defence Secretary um, were, were, you know, the, the, the other people couldn't listen in because they, they then told us. And it, it, I, so I can remember it. Um, and uh, it, it was a, you know, a sort of look at Ben Wallace and uh, it was one of those sobering moments. Uh, but then your, your mind's racing to, if I'm honest, you, might, you then click into, right, we're, we're, both, we're both heading to London, right, we confirmed that um, because there were some other places we, we, that the, the Defence Secretary might have to go to, confirmed it was then going to London, then had some meetings in, in that evening uh, to prep the Defence Secretary to then go across the road for a COBRA, um, and the COBRA was at you know, the, the, the Ministry of Defence meeting's at 20 hundred, the Cobra's at 2100. Ben Wallace then comes back and gives us a download. And the whole machine, it's, uh, what's impressive mm. is you come back into London and the machine has got going. And, and the heads up earlier in the day had allowed a certain elements of the machine to be primed. And, and, and that then, you know, you felt, it felt um, for what was a huge event feels that you're in control and you've got these brilliant people who have been working and planning this for years and years and gosh they're on it um, mm. and, and they're calm and right they take you through it and it's impressive. It, I mean it was only a, a slightly flippant question I was always told when I, when I was learning to fly helicopters that in the in the event and it will happen and it did happen that you have an emergency in the aircraft allow yourself <laughs> a second or two of blind panic to get it out of your system and then deal with the problem in yes. front of you, rather than have it linger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I don't. I, I agree with that. I think there's a kind of pause. Um, there's a yeah. That there is that sort of yeah. Because it, it, it sounds so trite. Because it's it's at one level it's predictable and it's not shocking, mm. but when you receive the news, it is slightly gasping. Um, you take a gut, um, but then. But I don't. I don't think. It, I don't. I. It wasn't the. Um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't the. Uh, I've lost control of the aeroplane. <laughs> oh no! Uh, I never said uh, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it was a. It was just a. It's just the weight of it. Yeah. It's the whack. Do you think it will help your relationship with King Charles that he f formerly served in the Royal Navy? I, d I don't think it's the fact that it's the Royal Navy. I mean, he's got a great reputation um, in terms of his time in the Royal Navy. Um, he was in command of a minesweeper. Um, he has regular reunions with 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 his uh, ship's company. It's broader than that. It's it's the relationship with all of the armed forces, and that he knows us and we know him. And and it's not just the king. It's the other members of the royal family. We're we're incredibly privileged to have that closeness, their interests, their knowledge. Um, all the, all the chiefs, uh, there are a couple of things around the funeral which I think um, were quite personal for the chiefs. And I don't want, yeah, you know, the main role was nearly, when you added, added it all up, it's 10,000 people. It's the security aspect, it's supporting uh, the, you know, all of the London authorities with millions of people coming into London. So whether it's the, 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 the long queue from Southwark, um, it's then the ceremonial aspects and so on. But a couple of things with the chiefs, we, we had the privilege of a vigil for Her Majesty the Queen in Westminster Hall. And 
So that then becomes quite daunting because you don't, you know, there's an element of um, getting that right. So you then go up to Hyde Park Barracks and you'll get drilled um, by, 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 by people that you would know well uh, for, for, for a couple of hours. Um, that was late on the Friday evening, the going into Saturday morning, the, the midnight slot. Later on the Saturday morning, we then all had our audience with the King, which is the Saturday before the funeral on the Monday. And that, that was a big moment. Because again, you're trying to manage somebody who's lost their mother, who then is also your, your monarch, um, and be respectful to them in, in both instances. And then for my, my piece was, and also try and get across these, this mass of um, condolences that you receive as, as, as a chief of defence from all over the world. And they are not polite, well, this is, they're, they're really warm uh, and, and, and inc incredibly affectionate and almost lenses into how some of these countries view the UK. And, and, and so that, would, you know, that was a, a brief conversation uh, with His Majesty about that. Um, and, then, and, then, and then we all, then the, the head of the Navy comes in, the head of the Army, the head of the Air Force, um, we, we all come in, the, the Vice Chief, the head of Strategic Command. Um, and then we had about 30 minutes uh, in, a, in a classic horseshoe um, chatting with His Majesty. Did you get one of those letters from General Grasimov? No. No, I didn't, but I'm trying to think I'm trying to think if there was something, I think Russia was respectful. And, and I think I, when you're clock, trying to clock everything, mm. I, I think it was, no, it, was, it was noticeable that Russia was, was respectful. What form did that take? I'm thinking of the language that, um, that President Putin used. Um, yeah. and, I, and, and again, I think that's really important because you, cause you can, the, the, danger, the danger with the Ukraine Russia war, and then our involvement, which is further back, but is 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 a strong supporter, and our clarity on that. The danger is you can't you can't you get so wrapped up in it that you can keep exaggerating and and it, and you need to analyse, but let's not overanalyze, and let's also try and be balanced. And 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 there are relationships that are still ongoing, and right, how can we utilise those, and how can you make the most of it? Bit of a segue, but do you think that's one of the reasons you have not been sanctioned by Russia? That there's just just a channel, a means. It's it's a message in itself, not sanctioning you, but it also allows uh, interaction that might otherwise not exist. I don't know. Is the is the honest answer? I'd like to think that it is that. Um, I'd like to think the conversations I've had with General Gerasimov. Um, we've always we've always said that we would. We would communicate that we have communicated, uh, but we wouldn't go into the detail of what we've discussed. And I think he's been very good at adhering to that. I've likewise have adhered to that. I, I would like it to be even more regular communications. I'd like it to be even stronger, even though they might be difficult conversations. Um, but the fact that that we can communicate, and it's the same with, with, with some of the other NATO chiefs, I think is really important. I, and I'm, ple so I'm, I'm pleased that I'm not blacklisted, uh, and I'd like to think that it's, it's that reason. I've, I've just been blacklisted by Iran this week. Oh. Um, Unlucky. Yes, so what, so... Uh, you weren't planning a holiday. <laughs> we weren't, we weren't. Um, but it's interesting, you know, that, 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 that you suddenly pop up that you're on a list and you're you're blacklist, blacklisted by Iran. Oh, but Susan, I mean, does, does that impact anything? I mean, is it just, <coughs> do you have to take extra security measures or, I mean, it's not a fatwa clearly, but I mean, does, are it's there any not, additional protocols you need to adhere to now? No, you then, you, did you, um, you go through the process to see right whether or not there is anything. That, 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 that's the piece. Hmm. And then, and then you're, that's part of a larger machine that's, that's giving you some security uh, the whole time anyway, and, and just looking for, for potential threats. Okay. Um, Last question on the, the, the funeral of the Queen. When you were being drilled by, I think, the Sergeant Major of, of London District, uh, you and the, the, the service chiefs, um, whose, whose foot drill was the worst? <laughs> was, was it Wigo's? Uh, it's normally mine. It's normally mine. I can't. I, I would love to stitch them up. Um, but the amount of abuse. I am... 
ceremonial is 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 not my forte. Um, so I I pity uh, the drill sergeants that have to uh, to try and get me in decent order, and I really appreciate their patience and their firmness and politeness when, but they get the message across. Um, to the here and now, David Williams, Permanent Secretary at the MOD, <coughs> told the Public Accounts Committee this week that 1,400 military personnel are being trained for strike cover, 600 to the border force for passport control, 600 uh, ambulance drivers, costing uh, other government departments about 5.6 million a week. Do you think service personnel who have been awarded a maximum of 3.75% pay rise with no legal right to withdraw their labour should be compensated for working over Christmases to cover for strikes? Do I, I've been really careful at not getting drawn into this, Dom. Um, I've taken a very straightforward approach, which is the armed forces serve the nation. We get directed by the government and, and, and therefore let's, let's avoid those political debates. Um, those, are, those are in the realm of ministers. And, and I don't want to get into the distinctions somehow that some people are drawing, that there are some things that, that, that um, we, might, we, might, we might be called in to do X, um, but we'll have then have this, um, this sort of debate about whether or not we get called in to do Y. Those debates are for government over X, Y, Z, whatever. And then when we're called, uh, we then respond. And, and so I'm, I'm staying well clear of that that whole piece. Okay, but the, but the Defence Secretary has said that the, the armed forces should not be, or should be the last resort other <coughs> government departments turn to in these situations. Um, do you agree with that? I mean, this is, a, this is a great opportunity for the public to see the military, keep, public, keep the, the armed forces in the public eye. Now, they're, we're not seeing pictures every day, thankfully, but from Iraq, Afghanistan, yes. and so on. I mean, this is a way of keeping the military in the public's consciousness. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a balance, and, and I think what um, the Defence Secretary is trying to to emphasise is we've got our, these professional responsibilities that we have to protect the nation and help it prosper, and for that you know it's an incredible training burden, and these are these these are expensive people, um, these are really high quality people, and you want to use their maximum value either because you've got that insurance policy that they can respond or we've got them out in the world and and, and, and they're supporting the government's policy uh, elsewhere and then there are responsibilities for for other government departments and, and 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 of course we can we can be called upon to help but i think i think the defense secretary is just just saying this we it would the government's position is 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 one that yeah, the military being the go-to is, is, would be a, an unusual position for us to arrive at. And therefore, there's a, there's a tempering uh, because we're not, this, we're not this spare capacity. We're busy and we're doing lots of things on behalf of the nation and, and, and we've got to focus on our primary role. And we'll respond when we have to, but I think he's just, he's just, um, he's just reminding people um, that actually other government departments uh, have to have to uh, have their own plans as to how they respond to all kinds of all kinds of uh, issues that they might have, and plus it's a feature of our size. We it, it would be it would be a slightly perilous um, to rely on defence to be doing all of these things uh, as 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 the ultimate backstop because because our role is not is our primary role is elsewhere. Well, it's interesting you. you you use the word perilous and you talk about balance and your primary role. Um, how many more of these MAC-A tasks, the military aid to the civil authority tasks, are you able to undertake before it starts to impact operational effectiveness? So we're, 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 mar we're miles off uh, in impacting operational effectiveness. So I think, you know, we, 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 again, we've got to just deheat um, this debate. Um, we respond to the government, we serve the nation, we're being asked to do some things. We can take that in our stride. It has an impact on the individuals, and we've got to we've got to acknowledge that. But in the in, yeah, I've also got to give you the reassurance that um, all of the all of the operations that we have planned, all of the things that we're doing, those are continuing as you'd expect. 
Um, we're halfway down my first page of questions, so we're racing through them. Um, in an interview this week in The Economist with my friend and colleague Shashank uh, Joshi, General Zeluzny, your, your opposite number in uh, the Ukrainian Armed Forces, said, I know that I can beat this enemy, but I need resources. I need 300 tanks, six to 700 infantry fighting vehicles, and 500 howitzers. What more can Britain provide to Ukraine? So we're, we're already providing a lot. We continue to, to provide. So we've been doing that as a constant. We've upped uh, all the way through. And I, won't, I don't want to go into the detail, Dom, but there, those, those responses, those conversations uh, with General Zelushny, trying to, trying to map into their plans, trying to understand what, what does he want to achieve at the operational level, What's his time scale? How do we then support that? How do we do it with international partners? That's a constant. And so that list there, we, that's, that's not a new list to us. Um, and, then, and then we look to respond, but we respond with all of our international partners. So I, I, won't, I won't go into the detail of those individual items, but um, we should anticipate that we, we continue to respond to Ukraine in the way that we have done over the last nine, nearly ten months now, and and that's both a, a, an, a, you know, a an amazing UK effort, but it's an amazing international effort, and that it, it and it's not just these lists. It, it's about equipment support. The, yeah, the tanks that the tanks that um, when the, my last visit um, to Kiev and we had this conversation uh, with President Zelensky. How much of it is new tanks and, and gifts in kind? How much of it actually the tanks that Ukraine has got or the tanks that Ukraine has captured, it becomes the really um, effective way is an equipment support. It's about spares, it's about refurbishing, it's about getting those tanks back into the line oh, that have I had to should have concentrated on logistics. No, no, I agree. It's all, um, but that, that the, com the com yeah, part of the conversation we're having is which, which that, that might be the fastest way to get the most number of tanks to General Zelushny, vice, right, let's go, to, uh, yeah, let's go back into the locker for a whole back bunch of new tanks. Now, you might, the, the chances are you're probably going to need to do both. Mm. But that's, no, that's the detail of what we're trying to do. And then you do that in, on an international scale. And, and what's the best way to do that? Is it... Um, is it support all the way through into Ukraine? And do they have hubs where they're repairing and so on? And obviously they do, but, but can, we, can we speed that up? And can we have a better system of what is it they need? Is it hubs um, yeah, on, on the countries bordering Ukraine? Uh, and how do we go about that? And then is it right, actually, we, which, which countries have got some tanks? And, and is that the best way to, to, to support him? And that's been a constant all the way through. You say this military support for Ukraine has, has been a constant. That's not, that's not entirely accurate, I may, I may venture. Early in the war, we had MiG gate, where Poland apparently was offering MiG-29s to Ukraine, and the US said no, or for whatever reason, that, that didn't happen. It was deemed too provocative or too escalatory, or there was something about that type of capability that was, that was not acceptable to the international um, partners for Ukraine at the time. And yet now we have um, HIMARS being sent, uh, NASAMs, being sent Patriot missiles, possibly Storm Shadow. So all very, very sophisticated weapon systems. What has changed? So I think it's been this constant uh, sort of balance of, and, it, and it's the dynamic. I mean, the, the, the whole, di it, it, this is a, it's a dynamic thing. And therefore it changes. Sometimes it changes from day to day, depending on the politics. Um, sometimes it changes from week to week. Sometimes it's changing by uh, the operational uh, ambition and what's going on, but it seems to be to me four factors: support Ukraine, in in and in within that you're imposing a cost on Russia because of its illegal invasion, and it's got to be seen that that aggression doesn't pay. Avoid escalation, and maintain international unity. And and that's what that's what you're doing, and and the the danger with so if you, go, if you go too far out, too strongly, and that then is really uncomfortable for nation X, and you then start to fracture your international unity, that's not a good place to be. 
And, and if you look at it, it you know, some elements of this, the, it's been relatively contained in, in geographic terms. Um, we've avoided this being a war within NATO. We've avoided it being Americanized. President Putin would love this to be Americanized or NATOized. So there's a discipline there. Um, and then you've got to protect NATO and that eastern flank. Um, but you've also got to support this, this, this partner with Ukraine. And, and so it's this balance. And that's, I think that's why you've seen some things at the outset would, would have been incredible. Um, but over the course of um, the war, then you see different responses. And some of the responses are, are, to, are to Russia's further aggression. So you know, on, the, on that list there, the air, there's a massive air defense effort now. Um, and my worry, that's, that's the right thing to do for Ukraine. But it's a defensive thing. You, yeah, we, and, and, and we've got to be very uh, aware of that. It's, all you're doing is, 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 is better protecting Ukraine from this onslaught from Russia. Now, that's really crucial, whether it's the critical national infrastructure or it's to, to give President Zelensky the authority that he can, he can bring people back that have been displaced. And then can that, yeah, can, that's a fundamental for him and his government. Can that then get, help the Ukraine economy going? Because that's another way of defeating the aggression that Russia's meted out. Um, but it's defensive. Um, and, and we've got to acknowledge it. That, that, yeah, so that, and then yeah, well, are there are other things where Ukraine might be wanting to go on the offensive. Well, how, we, how, how can we help them there? Uh, in your annual Rusi speech, Royal United Services Institute speech on uh, Wednesday this week, you praised, quote, the ingenuity, courage and determination of Ukraine and said the brutality of Putin begets resolve, resolve begets support, support begets victory. I'll go with that, but the next one, victory, begets many, many questions. After, however this is resolved, do you think Ukraine should be fast-tracked into NATO membership? I think... I, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you a quick answer on that. I think the correct response with that is a, is a, much, uh, is a much longer, because it's quite a profound conversation. NATO's, NATO's growing with the addition of Finland and Sweden. That, that's a, a significant move in itself. We have got closer to Ukraine. Um, that goes all the way back, but you know, in recent times, post Russia's invasion of Crimea, Operation Orbital, a big effort both in terms of land and maritime, 22,000 uh, troops trained since 2014 inside Ukraine. 10, amazing effort by the British Army this year to train 10,000 in UK. A shift that is happening in terms of the armaments that Ukraine is getting, which is much more NATOized by, by dint of what's gone on. But I think for those conversations, you've then got to look at what's going on in, in, in the whole of the, the Euro-Atlantic Euro security and these balance and shifts of, of, of power. And, 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 and therefore, what are the repercussions of, of Ukraine joining NATO? Um, because at the same time, you've got, you've got 20 nations within NATO uh, all increasing their defense spending. You've got these two... Yeah, the, these, are, these are significant military powers in terms of Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Um, NATO is a defensive alliance. NATO is really clear in terms of its purpose. But we also recognize that, that not all countries, and Russia especially, um, doesn't see NATO that way. So, we, so, so I think our politicians have then got to balance all of those factors uh, and, and then have the conversation with Ukraine. Uh, and and, and is, yeah, is that the direction? And then is there a timeline that goes with that? But it's not a, right, let's accelerate. Yeah, I think those, those are for politicians to decide, but they need to take into account all those factors. OK, so back, back to the military side <coughs> then. If Ukraine have got Patriot, High Mars, they're buying NASAMs, I think, in a statement of confidence for the future, I think their, their contract goes out to 2025 to deliver these things. Um, if those systems are not integrated with NATO, the, the yes. same systems in NATO, then it, it, I wouldn't say is it almost worth having them. But I mean, there's a real by, by knitting no. them together. That that is not NATO membership clearly, but is that a is that a security guarantee that that is that is very significant? 
Joe, I, I, I'm only pausing because you, you used the, the, the word security guarantee and that guarantee is more of the language of NATO and, and Article 5. I think we have to give the, the it's an agreement, it's assurance, it's uh, for the Ukraine government to have the confidence that, that uh, and for us to signal that Russia can't can't illegally invade again and I yeah this has been catastrophic for Russia um, I, I'm yeah part of that Rusi speech was trying to amplify what a disaster this has this has been for Russia and therefore this notion that you can almost casually invade a country and it will all be dealt with quite quickly and you know my leaders will take control of their cities and then we'll say so, um, and just the, the the, the nonsense of, of those kind of plans and what actually unravels and how difficult it is to control war and all of those classical elements where we, that's what I think is happening with, with Russia's experience of this war. But at the end of it, that's why it's so important that Russia's aggression has been seen to be defeated and that it, the world learns and Russia learns that, that, that aggression doesn't pay. But I think if you're in Kyiv, you don't want to rely on that and therefore you will want to be able to turn around to your partners and know that you're, you're being supported and that might need to be bolstered. And then is that, is that, um, is that some integration in terms of airspace? Is it, how, do we, how, do we, how do we carry on the journey to, to, um, for Ukraine with Western kit? But you, and you're absolutely right, it's not then, right, let's just pile up and that's all the same kit as us. It is things like integration. Um, and I know, again, that's a kind of boring word, but it is, the, the, yeah, it's, what, it's airspace, it's situational awareness. You then might get to some other things, intelligence sharing. Um, and those are the fundamentals that then, that then make that kit so much more worthwhile. But that's, that's, those are conversations to be had um, uh, yeah, as, as we get closer to you know, what looks like to be an end. And in terms of any end, in the absence of a UN Security Council um, sponsored accountability mechanism, how should Putin and the other senior Russian leadership be held to account for this war? Any special carve out for the ICC? I understand the US are trying to find a way of interacting yeah. with the ICC that they, they hitherto have not done, but some, some way of, of involving the ICC in a post-conflict accountability mechanism. Or is any such talk of this just a, an impediment to peace now? Anyway, if Putin sees what well, no, might I, be lined up for him, is, I, think, no... I, I, I think I think um, I think those mechanisms are are in place. Oh yeah, I think the the implication of committing war crimes, of illegal invasions, and that those, those implications carry on over time, I think is, uh, has, been, has, be, has, has, has been put in place in the way that you, you saw from, from the Balkans, those trials in The Hague that, that, might, be, um, that might be a long time after, after the violence uh, has, has ended, but the international community pursues war crimes and pursues individuals. So whether that's an ICC or whether that's a, some other mechanism, I think that now has become a, a, you know, it's becoming a staple of international relations and international behavior. And um, Ukraine has, has some suggestions that they've been putting through the United Nations to to try to carve out something that isn't that isn't ICC because because Russia and Ukraine uh, aren't members, but follows the the principles and the mantra and if you like the protocols that you see in the ICC, and does that then become the mechanism to hold people to account? But the notion the notion that that the, that you have these clean finishes, um, I think is is is, is slightly flawed. I think we, yeah, they, they, there are implications to what has happened, and they go on in, 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 into time. 
and you've got an international community these days that has the capacity to follow through um, and, and, and keep investigating and holding people to account. And we've seen, we've seen that. And, and I don't know which way it will go and how long that takes and so on. But the, um, that, is, that, that liability um, is, is hanging there um, uh, because, because of what Russia has done. Not expecting you to comment on an ongoing investigation, but how would you describe the culture in UK Special Forces today? So I think the culture is, is as, 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 as you would recognise from your service and, uh, and where we think uh, we are now. These, these, are, these are extraordinary people that serve their country in an extraordinary way. And we are very confident of that the right culture exists. And we, as this is all the chiefs, we are really clear about ensuring that the reputation of our special forces, the reputation of our armed forces stays up here and is super high. And that also the relationship with government and the, the license to operate in a particular way that special forces have, that that's also precious. And therefore, it's right when, when, when there are allegations and, and there are concerns that we then, the government announced yesterday a statutory inquiry. We're fortunate to have somebody in Charles Haddon Cave who is so esteemed to, to then conduct that inquiry. And our responsibility is, um, is that the, the, the same standards apply for everybody. Uh, and, and if there have been wrongdoings, then, then let's uh, root, root that out. But also, let's also be super confident about what our special forces provide, what our armed forces provide, what the cultures are, and, and how that allows us to continue to serve the nation and to serve the government the way that we do. So this is the right thing to do. Um, and this is not some, yeah, it's not, the, 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 there's not some anxiety that's, that's loaded here. It's about preserving this extraordinary reputation and this extraordinary license to operate that the armed forces have and especially our special forces have. And those are, those are precious entities and, and you protect them. And if there are some allegations that have been made uh, and, 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 and they need to be re-explored, well, let's do the sensible thing and look again. The dates in the terms of reference for uh, Lord Justice Haddon Cave's inquiry, mid-2010 to mid-2013, is that, obviously we're in Afghanistan for a lot longer than that, is that a capacity thing on, on Lord Justice Haddon Cave and his team? Or, I mean, that, very, that, that sort of is very much suggested of there was an issue with special forces. I mean, do you think it was wise to limit the dates to, to that time period? Would you welcome the, the dates being expanded? No, I think it's, a, it's the correct thing to do. There are, there are two particular cases that have, that have undergone a, a judicial review and because of those, those have then triggered the need to have a closer look. And, and, and so Lord Justice Haddon Cave has, had a, has, has sort of had a preliminary examination and recognises that those, those two and some others over that period merit a, a closer look. And that is it's absolutely the right thing to do. Otherwise, you, the, that would be awful for, for, for these, these, these extraordinary people that serve their country and believe they've done the right thing and it's kind of right now we're, going, we're just going to open everything up and, and, and have a look at it. There, there isn't, the, the, there's a particular reason to look again at some particular instances. It's the right thing to do. Uh, it protects those people, it protects the reputation, it protects the license to operate. Uh, it's the responsible thing for yeah, the chiefs with ministers um, to do. Um, but, but let's keep it bounded um, because, because, because there are particular issues that are being looked at. On to personnel. If people <coughs> are the military's greatest asset, why are so many living with damp, broken boilers, black mould? Uh, I'm getting photographs, anecdotes, messaging of appalling living conditions. Um, and it seems that the MOD, Pinnacle, Amy, Vivo, the whole infrastructure side of the, of the business 
is going badly wrong somewhere. Why, why, why are people living, still living in these conditions? So we've shifted from one contract to another. It's, 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 it's got some issues that we're dealing with. It is unacceptable for people to have mold in their homes or the, the, uh, um, the frustration, whether it's single living accommodation or families accommodation, where you're, you, don't have, you don't have hot water for a shower. Um, those stories where you know, children's bedrooms and they're absolutely freezing, that is totally unacceptable. We've got to get after it. So we've got a defense infrastructure organization that is, that is working with the contractors. We quadrupled the number of people that can deal with, with those complaints. We've got a, uh, a waiting list of, of complaints. So there's a, you know, the, those have now been worked through and they're going down rather than what was being going on over the last month, they were going up. So they're being dealt with. There will be the 24 seven uh, response all the way through the Christmas period. So we've upped our game and that's not going to, to slow down because, because we then jolt into Christmas. So it's, it's unacceptable. Our standards are high. And those people, if the, org if the organization's not responding well enough, they also need to use their chain of command because we look after each other no matter what. So, so that's the response to those issues. The broader piece is we know that we need to continue investing in our estate and we need to keep making the most of an accommodation offer that actually is, is unusual for, for most people in, 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 in their walks of life. We subsidize people's accommodation to the tune of 5,000 to 20,000 a year. We've just introduced, we you know, forces help to buy as a, instead of it just being well, for another couple of years, it's going to continue. So we encourage people to buy their own home if they can. So that's, that's up to 50% of your salary, depending on where you, where you are on the salary scale, and you get an interest-free loan. That's massively important in terms of where people are and the, and the cost of housing now. We then helped in other areas, um, childcare, wraparound childcare. I was speaking to uh, a sergeant uh, recently. That allows, that's, that's about 450 pounds a month for him with, with, with his daughter that allows his wife to now go back to work, which allows them to, to, to have two incomes and they can, they can, they can buy their own home. They, it's, it's those things. We've capped, um, we've capped the accommodation charges at 1%. Um, we've capped the, the food charges. 98% of our family's accommodation is either at or exceeds the decent living homes standard uh, that the government has. For single living accommodation, I think it's about it's ninety percent. So, so you've got these dreadful cases that we have to deal with, but let's also look at the backdrop. And the backdrop is subsidised accommodation of the right standard, continue to be invested in, uh, and that's absolutely right because we we have really talented, high quality people. We're in a we're in a, a fight with other organisations for talent. Um, and it doesn't match who we are. If this is if this is really ropey, and we're trying to say right, we're trying to be we're trying to be modern. We're trying to be at the front end of technology, um, and this this is a complete misalignment. And that and, and, and it's 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 unacceptable. And it's it's more than just the the particular issue of some poor family worried about their child um, on any day. It doesn't matter whether it's Christmas or whatever. It's it's the misalignment about who we are and what we are and what we're trying to trying to instill as to what it means to be in the armed forces. So I, I mean I hear stories of quartermasters signing out sleeping bags for children who are completely against what, what they what they should what they should be doing. I mean if, if that was ever brought to light by whatever whatever disciplinary issue, do you, do you think those individuals should should be told look that's that's fine. Get them that's over. Fine. The d d d I, I absolutely trust in a, in, a, in a QM to take the right decision. I my frustration with this is um, so that QM, yeah, that, that, that um, whether he's um, an NCO or uh, yeah an, an an LE officer, these are people that in other parts of their military life, they take people into battle with their section and they, they take extraordinary decisions to achieve an objective and they put people's lives at risk. The same, when we talk about empowerment, right, that person needs to be empowered 
to take one of our sleeping bags because he's got a really dreadful situation with a family that we want to look after. And of course, yeah, and if he thinks in the moment, right, the best thing to do is to give them a sleeping bag, we then don't charge him for giving, yeah, right, you've, you've offended the rules and so on. I trust that individual to take the right decision. And then the really big issue is, right, can we sort out why he's having to give a sleeping bag to, to that family? But I, I despair when, again, it's this misalignment. Mi yeah, um, these extraordinary people with extraordinary skills, um, and they, 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 yeah, how can we use that and extraordinary commitment? How can we use that whether you're in a, 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 an operational war fighting situation or you're in the home base trying to look after the, 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 the morale of your soldiers, sailors and aviators. They're all the same thing and these are the same individuals. Why do so many veterans and a number of serving <coughs> personnel um, complain to me of their experiences, interestingly not the financial outcome, but their experiences more often of the Armed Forces Compensation Scheme? I'm told yeah. it's a very adversarial process now. The, the, the balance of trying to get value for money for the taxpayer, vice you know, giving too much money away, yeah. is, is now too much in, in over the other side of, of trying to downplay the injury, putting uh, one chap I spoke to, his, his, his hip and femur were shattered by high velocity around Afghanistan. That was downgraded to a broken leg. So it's still got some money, but I mean it, it just seems far too adversarial to far too car insurance to push the claims down and, and give out the minimum. I'm hearing this time and time again through the arm, about the Armed Forces Compensation Scheme. So I, I, uh, that might be an area, um, that, that might be um, a weak area for me that I'm not, I've, I've heard some of those, I don't, you know, when you say it's as strong as that, I don't know if it's because there were so many cases by dint of the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and my, my worry with them is the, the, the length of time it takes to deal with them and the fact that you are, it does become adversarial and so on, as opposed to our obligation to look after that person, whether they're still in or, or they've left. Um, and, and can we get the right tone? Um, it's, you know, the, same, the same for me was, you know, um, if, you want to join, if you want to join the armed forces, uh, we should be laying out a red carpet. You want to serve your nation in uniform and, 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 and that should be the tone. You have been disadvantaged by your service in uniform. We should be coming to you and ensuring that that is as smooth a transition as possible. And so, so I, I, and I the, the examples that you give, I probably need to go, and go back and have a look at, the, at where we are in the system um, and what's going wrong. Um, because, because again, this tone, tonal point I absolutely get that that's the bit that frustrates people, that they've done this extraordinary sacrifice and, and we, c we come across as, w as if we're quibbling when that poor person is, is thinking, Shit, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't lose my life, but please can you sort out my leg? But they were prepared to lose their life and that's the commitment that we have to those individuals and we've got, it, we've got to get that right. All three services have had their problems with the issue this year, how can you make the military a safer place for women to serve their country? Lots, lots, lots of things that we we can do. Um, it, it's a it's a trust and a confidence issue. Um, there are some things which, where yeah, where we have not been getting it right, we've got to acknowledge it, and we've got to allow those people to come forward and and have the confidence in the system that the culprits will be called out and be, and be dealt with. We've we've done we've done a bunch of things. A defence serious crimes unit. So, to take some of these sensitive issues out of the chain of command, and 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 therefore you've got that independence and independence and objectivity that hopefully reassures people that the complaint will be dealt with properly. A big thing that we've done is zero tolerance for unacceptable behaviour that has a sexual element to it. In the same way that we've got that clarity around drugs, we're now introducing the same clarity around sexual issues. And, and dealing with those in a very clear way. And then there are some softer issues in terms of uh, if we're serious, uh, and we are serious in terms of we want to reach out in this fight for talent and we have to reach out to the whole nation. So whether you're male, female, uh, regardless of your, your ethnic background, we want, to, we want to take the best talent 
because we need the best talent serving in the armed forces. If we have uniforms that, that don't happen to fit you because you're a woman, because the, the, the uniforms were completely designed around men, then again, it's this misalignment. It doesn't make sense. So get after it. So those are some of the things that we're doing. But can we also have the confidence that 85% yeah, of, of all women that serve in the armed forces recommend to other women to go and join the armed forces? So can we, be, can we respond to some of the issues that we need to respond to, but we, can we have the confidence again that we get a lot right? And serving in the armed forces, whether you're male or female, is, is an incredible experience. We give, you, we give you additional skills. You grow as an individual. You have open opportunities within the armed forces, and you have opportunities when you leave the armed forces. And this should be a positive experience for everybody because you're part of this special cadre that serves the nation in that way. And, and, and that, that, those are the fundamentals. And we've got to make sure that that's the same for everybody who serves. So a busy year. I bet the time has flown. Um, I mean, it won't be much longer before you're thinking about what's next. What are the, what are the last bits and bobs you want, to, you want to see done on your watch? Um, and I can ask Yeah, there, well, there are lots. Um, so if, if I said, it's a busy year, it's being dominated by Ukraine, um, it's 15 overseas visits, three times to Kyiv, um, it's some big decisions, um, so some amazing soldiers in Mali uh, and, and amazing soldiering, but when you then look at it, the relationship that we have with the Malian government that have shifted to, to Russia and to the Wagner group means that you know, We've had to recommend, and government's taken the difficult decision to leave Mali. Um, there are lots of other things going on in addition to, to Ukraine in the operational space. But in terms of where we're trying to steer the armed forces to the future, we've got this massive program to modernize. And, and we've got to, to make the most of this capital investment that's being made, the backdrop of a technological revolution and have the confidence that this is an opportunity to shift our armed forces for the future. And we stay as these, this incredible reputation that the UK armed forces have, where allies want us to be alongside them, and where we have what a, you know, this, this disproportionate effect when a UK serviceman or woman turns up with their equipment, with their philosophy of, of war fighting, and, and that's, that's the thing that we keep for the future. And that's why yeah, to me, the, 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 this agenda is about modernization and, and, and having an even better armed forces, more productive, more lethal, uh, and more deployable. Uh, and that's, that's the journey that we're on. Much, much more to, to, to speak about. I'd love to speak about Mali. You've just raised it there. But very quickly, AUKUS, the Australia-UK-US partnership, you said recently that that could be the vehicle for an increased number of submarines and basing in the Indo-Pacific. Are we talking um, astute class hunter killers, Vanguard, Dreadnought class bombers, but increased number of British submarines, possibly with foreign crews serving, and where might these things be based in the Indo-Pacific? So I think we've had two very big, um, well, there are two very big strategic deals going on in terms of the Indo-Pacific. You saw it last week with GCAP, the, the Global Combat Air Program, with, with Italy and Japan, sixth generation fighter. These are these are deals that then shape for the next, next 50, 75 years. They're, 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 they, these are big and strategic. There might be other partners that then join, and that's part of this modernization, that the UK will have a sixth generation fighter, will have an industrial base that supports it, that is at the front end of technology. You've then got this other deal, which is still going through, so that then gives the opportunity for Australia to have nuclear submarines, not, not nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines and nuclear technology, this precious technology that the UK and America share. And we're talking, how does that help our nuclear enterprise? And, and what does that mean when we come to replace the astute submarines? So we shape around SSN AUKUS as the replacement. We take the best of, of, of a combination of, of, of a US uh, US technology and, and US um, inventory blended with British technology uh, and is that the best route forward for, for Australia, 
for its future nuclear submarines. And then does that then mean, which is the, the other strategic part of this, how do you link up with Australia and America, but also how do you take advantage of the underwater domain? That we have an advantage over our competitors under, under the sea, that we know that the world is becoming more and more transparent, and therefore that advantage is going to become even more important and therefore does that become an area that we invest in even more? And, and, and that's what you then get out of AUKUS, uh, a strategic deal that stretches across the world, a strengthening of our own nuclear enterprise and an opportunity to take an advantage of, of a domain where we excel and we think it will be even more important in the future. And then there'll be the debate about on the back of that and that kind of shared investment that's going on, does that then allow us to to look at the replacement for astute and how many submarines do we do we then replace the seven astutes uh, in, in the 2030s with? And I, I can't go into numbers because I think that will be something that we'll look at more carefully as part of the integrated review refresh in March and April. Um, can we afford the tilt to the Indo-Pacific? 3% GDP on defence is looking vulnerable now. Um, and you've just said the Chinese Navy might be in the North Atlantic with the melting ice cap. So why do we need to go to the Indo-Pacific? There's lots of reasons why we go to the Indo-Pacific, but also this, this notion that it's an, it's a, it's an ore, we st we're, our primary area is the North Atlantic. Our primary responsibility is to the UK and our NATO partners. And we're the leading European partner within NATO. That's, that's a staple, that's, that stays there. This is an and, and in a world where you're the sixth largest economy, the world's GDP in the next 20 years is going to reach 40 to 50% coming from the Indo-Pacific, and you're a trading nation, you're, you, you, you have interest beyond, beyond the Euro-Atlantic. You then also have this extraordinary relationship that one of the ways that we keep Europe safe and protected is this really strong partner called America. And, and, and a part of that relationship with America involves being really close and having shared values and interests. And therefore we, wouldn't, we, we shouldn't be surprised that when that really close partner um, is looking in a different direction and is concerned about the Indo-Pacific and knows that it has to increase its allies and partnership to deal with those security concerns, then, then it, would expect, it would expect nations like the UK to be closely aligned. And that, that's what's going on. That's why you see AUKUS, that's why you see FCAS. Um, but it, it builds on what we've already got, the Five Powers Defence Agreement, uh, Brunei, uh, Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the, the establishment of Bahrain as, as a base uh, in, in the Gulf the increased investment in Duckham, in Oman, the increased investment in Kenya. Um, yeah, the UK, the last IR, uh, I think got it right by just this strange word tilt. It's a tilt, it's not, it's not a shift, it's not a pivot, it's not, we're now focusing on the Indo-Pacific. And you should definitely demand that uh, when our budget is nearly 50 billion pounds a year, you should be demanding, right, how can we do even more for the nation? And, and that's, what, that's what we're looking to do. So um, I think this is uh, an exciting debate. It makes strategic sense. The government's really clear that that's what it expects of us. Um, and then we look at, right, what, how much does this cost? That will be part of the, the, the refresh that's happening in March and April. And, and some of these big contracts, such as AUKUS and, and, and GCAP now, uh, and the need to invest further in nuclear because, because we need a new nuclear warhead when you look in the sort of decades to come, those are, those are expensive um, issues that needs to be totted up um, and, then, and then you balance it all out and, and, and you have the conversation with government. But I, to me, yeah, it's, it's too crude to, to think, right, we, yeah, there's, there's, the, there's, there's Europe uh, and the Atlantic uh, or the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's an and conversation. And, and the, the first point of call is you should be demanding of us and how do we contribute in both, in, in, in both spheres? That's a lot of money, 50 billion pounds. And there's mould in children's bedrooms in Aldershot. It, 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 it is, and that's why it's unacceptable. Um, and that's why we're, we're dealing with the mould in, in, in somebody's bedroom. 
um, but you deal with the whole lot. Uh, and that's the, that's the, that's the privilege of, 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 and the responsibility uh, of leadership uh, and, and making the right choices and dealing with the problems when they, when they arise, but also shaping for the future and delivering for the nation both in the here and now, which I think this year has been all about, um, but also shaping for the future and embracing the future with confidence and excitement um, because the UK Armed Forces are a superb armed forces uh, and we've got a superb future ahead of us. Are you getting any time off over Christmas? Not, notwithstanding that you're, you're never off duty, but how do, you, how do you carve out time to rest your mind and, and, and keep, keep, keep fighting through, throughout the tenure so of your got, command? Uh, I think I, I've, got, I've, I've, I've got a yeah, large family. We've got four, four sons. They'll all be back for Christmas. Um, I've got lots of friends at home, uh, so we've got the usual sort of Christmas things that, that, that go on with, with and, and most of those friends are, are not military, so that's, uh, that, I think that's pretty healthy. The last few months I've done some things where I right, kind of go and carve out time to read novels and just do that um, to stop this getting sucked in. Can you, can you occasionally carve out time to see a play or two in London to just again stay refreshed? Can you, can you do some fitness, not doing enough, but can I kind of play a bit more squash, a bit more tennis, do all of that? Um, and then can you, can you make the most of a, of a Christmas period? And, and, and we're doing it. So this week, we're in most of next week because the, 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 there are various meetings going on across Whitehall. Um, there's then a dip in to make sure you stay on top of the intelligence because there's a phenomenal amount of intelligence um, that you need to keep, keep reading and, and, and keep on top of. Um, but within that, you, there, 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 there's, there's time for a break as well. Um, so so it's, it's good. Have you been a good boy this year? What do you think? I'd, the, I'd like to think so. <laughs> what do you think the big guy in the ill-fitting suit would say? And I don't mean Ben Wallace. <laughs> um, I think he'd say, well done and get ready for another tough year. Admiral Tony Bradkin, Chief Defence Staff, thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much, Dom.